the lead travel commentator in Ireland. He's a historian, author, and broadcaster. And he was a member of the Tourism Recovery Task Force in, in, in 2020. His story lined the GAA Museum in Croke Park. And listening to Owen beforehand, he is very, to use it, to borrow a phrase from a violin or that, he has a lot more strings to his bow than just, uh, than just um, travel. So an extremely interesting man, and I think, I think, he, he, uh, I think he'll really enjoy Owen. Uh, the subject of uh, our summer school was one of the earliest travel commentators. I suspect that Oliver Goldsmith's um, would be on the Instagram or the Twitter of his age, which was something quite different. It was these wonderful uh, highfalutin, or no suck would be the Irish word, Augustan rhyming couplets where everything was very grandiose. And his, the first book that had Goldsmith's name on it was the uh, it was a travel uh, travel poem an elongated travel poem where he talked about different countries of Europe Switzerland where they were poor uh, that was what they were then Italy where they used to have this amazing history in this past and what they were left with was the artworks of the previous age, and they were very showy and um, very grandiose about it. And then the, mo the more modern Johnny Come Lately countries, like Britain and like the Netherlands, where the rich were buying up everything and leaving the poor behind. And that was his, uh, his first work, is the work that um, made his name as himself. So, it's a good theme. It's a, it, it lends itself easily to the theme of this weekend. What is, to, what is, is, the, impact, what is the implication of uh, travel, the modern world of travel, the post-COVID world of travel, for places like Oliver Goldsmith's uh, homeland? This is the man who wrote that life is a journey that must be travelled no matter how bad the roads and accommodations are. And um, anyone who remembers Kinnegat on a bank holiday weekend will know exactly what he was talking about. The reality is that Longford, the hidden heartlands of the brand, and I've heard of Arthur, uh, I've heard, seen lots of very snazzy presentations about the branding of Fulcher Ireland and its different products. I've heard very few that are as good as what Arthur said earlier on tonight about the Galads lined up. <laughs> Five counties get the bulk of tourism into Ireland, Cork, Kerry, Galway, um, Antrim and Dublin. And the rest, all, some of them are left behind. But the ones that were left behind, like the kids in the yard getting picked for the team. And I was one of the kids left behind as well, Arthur. Uh, Longford, the figures for 2018, I don't have uh, really up-to-date figures. The figures are all over the place since 2019 anyway. But it, you can pretty much hold that the figure for overseas international tourism for Longford were at the bottom of the chart, joint bottom of the chart with Fermanagh, about 40,000 tourists. And the others were all pretty much in that realm. So, well, what we have in Goldsmith, Goldsmith's Heartland, at Goldsmith's Summer School, at Goldsmith's Festival, is a discussion about the, the middle of Ireland, the wet middle, I think one of the comedians called it, uh, the, wet, the middle of Ireland that has been left behind in every single term. I'm going to bring in four different themes to this. We're going to be, maybe we'll have a little bit of a discussion uh, at, at the end, but over the next 28 to 30 minutes, I'm going to bring in four different themes to di this. The dilemma of that branding, how to face up to the dilemma of branding, the dilemma of getting your, your mix right between national and local attractions. You, do we have national attractions in the middle and why not? The dilemma of dispersal, five counties getting the bulk of tourism into the island. That remains true. We've very successful tourism product, but it's not being dispersed. It hasn't been dispersed. 
And finally, the dilemma of history. And I'm not talking about the big history about um, St. Chiron setting, setting up one of the great centres of learning in Europe. Uh, here are the one of the towering figures, not just in Ireland, not just internationally, but in, any, in, in English and in any language, one of the towering figures uh, of the 18th century, indeed of any century, being born a few kilometres of here. I'm talking about the history of tourism in Ireland, to which we seem to be incredibly behoven. I think we are still living out the plans and the dreams and the vision of a tourism leaders who are no longer with us, but who went before us by a few decades. Yours to uncover. That is the brand for the Hidden Heartlands. I know how these things work. I have a fair idea. I've been covering travel for a long, long time. My own career, by the way, is in three simple one-thirds. I was a sports writer initially, then a news writer, now a travel writer. But I've been, what I've learned from all three, but what I've especially learned from travel, is that people bring uh, brand experts, marketing experts, into a room and ask them to come up with a slogan. And we have some really crazy slogans. We have really great slogans around the world, but we have some really crazy ones as well. Some of the great sorts of slogans, you'll remember them. New Zealand, 100% pure. They've had that slogan for 25 years. They've never changed it. Why? It works. It's brilliant. So brilliant is it that Tasmania had to, you know, took a little version of it for themselves. It gives great pleasure to New Zealanders that one of the worst slogans in the history of tourism came from Australia. Uh, I don't know who thought this up and what bar they were in and how much Victorian bitter they'd had, but they came up with this slogan around, uh, I think it was 2006 or 2005, and it was, where the bloody hell are you? And they recorded ads and they broadcast them around the world before a year before they came back and came up with a slogan, called, a very basic slogan, but it's a real um, try and limit the damage slogan called, there's nothing like Australia. There was a slogan which wasn't a tourism slogan, but is used, uh, I heart New York. No doubt that caught everybody. That actually stands out internationally as one of the great, great, great slogans. And what, happened in Ve what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. Doesn't need any explanation. Everybody knows, oh, there's something risky. There's something a bit risque going on above the ordinary. It's exactly what you want to say if you're Las Vegas. And we come back to yours to uncover. Because we have this amazing product, which isn't to do with the number of tourists, which is abysmal, by the way. The number of international tourists coming to the Hidden Heartlands is abysmal. It's nothing to do with the population. It's one of the least, most sparsely populated areas. It's to do with what the Hidden Heartlands has to offer. And it's like somebody has not quite worked out what they do have to offer. If you look at the website, it's all about uh, history, sharing the rural experience, all of that. It's very difficult to say that there's something here that you can't find right the length and breadth of Europe. You know, people like, countries like Slovenia, which Slovenia uses um, the love, S-L-O-V-E, you know, it sort of differentiates that um, as a sort of a derivation of I Heart New York. But Slovenia set out to do something which was uh, very clever. They just tried to corner the market of sustainable tourism. Slovenia's tourism is no more sustainable than Ireland's, certainly no more sustainable than the Hidden Heartlands. But they went after it and they told everyone. Because... What I've learned from writing and from traveling and from visiting places is that bringing tourists to your area is very little to do with the quality of the product. It's to do with the noise you make. People go to places that really aren't as nice as somewhere even down the road. They go there because their reputation is sold successfully. It's sold for a couple of ways. It's, it's sold by the, 
the storytelling that you know the the famous uh, um, Goldsmiths was uh, supported funded uh, by Samuel Johnson and Samuel Johnson's famous statement, um, which I don't think Samuel Johnson made, but the mythology is that Samuel Johnson said of the Giants Causeway, worth seeing but not worth going to see. <laughs> so the Giants Causeway, even in the 18th century, was a brand that was bring people were going to, you successfully sell this idea that somewhere is fantastic and people go there in huge numbers and they all end up in the same places. And I thought when somebody invented the internet that that would all change, that the smaller places, the places that are even more beautiful, that aren't being visited, you know, um, Niagara Falls is really not the most spectacular thing you're ever going to see compared with all the other falls in the area even. Multnomah Falls on the other side of the country, all of these. But it's got the name and the reputation. It's got a, an industry, it's got buses, it's got the um, Maid of the Mist boat floating around. Everybody wants to go there because they have to go there. And the attractions that people were going to in big numbers across Europe and across the world they're going in even bigger numbers to the same places. Barcelona, Dubrovnik, complaining about crowds before COVID struck. They were talking about measuring and curtailing visitors to their areas. And Instagram and Twitter and TripAdvisor, TripAdvisor with its series of lists, the top 10 attractions, Instead of dispersing people, it's moving, it's working in the other direction. It's actually concentrating more and more people into a smaller group of attractions. Now, that's the way that uh, search engines, which aren't independent search engines, they're paid search engines, that's the way human nature is, that's the way the bragging of the influencers, you know, here I am, I have to be in some front of somewhere recognisable or my number of clicks or my number of um, click-throughs will, will not be high enough for me to generate an income out of that. But the way European tourism is set up is there, should, there are safeguards supposed to be put in place against that, that the smaller areas and the, sm and the less familiar places should be able to generate the sort of business that people in this area and in areas like this can generate employment, income, can generate the infrastructure, the money to build the infrastructure, to build the roads that benefit the local population. The reason we have, we don't have to queue through Kindergat on a bank holiday Friday is partly because the rest of Europe realised that there's a very large population of people who want to get to the west of Ireland. And it was an easy argument to win in the right environment that proper roads should be built to transport people around our island to showcase those amazing attractions that we have. Which brings us to the other dilemma. What's a, where do we start telling international tourists to come to the hidden heartlands? Where do we get the confidence to say, we are an international product, we're not just a local product. An adventure centre where paddle boats are available and things like that, it's not, it's not, it's a great local attraction. It's not something that's going to bring someone to make a booking from Hamburg or somewhere like that. We have in the Hidden Heartlands maybe two, I think there's only two attractions that are in the top 100 in the country. One of them is, um, uh, one of them is Clonmac Noise, and that's down somewhere in the 80s. And I think Burr Castle is just in the top 100, it's somewhere towards the end. These figures would be from a few years ago. So, second dilemma, we do have uh, a problem that we don't have an international attraction that we can go to 
international tourism booths in Berlin, the biggest tr uh, trade fair in the world, and wave in front, in front of people's noses, or World Travel Market in London, or Fitur in uh, Madrid, or any of the other great ones. That's, that isn't a, a fatal problem, but it's something that is confronting everyone who is dealing with transforming the counties, the middle counties of Ireland, into something that makes them a player on the international stage. There isn't, it isn't a fatal attraction for, a fatal, uh, um, a fatal uh, disability because there are ways around that. And one of the ways around it is to build the um, through ways, the sort of the Royal Canal ways, things like that. They, I mean, you could actually build the profile of some of your amazing attractions. I think Arigna is one of the best attractions in the country. Corley Walkway. Their, the profile can be built up. The hard work has been done in trying to build that up, but it's still not happened for them. But the pulling together of the cycleways, the walkways, the routes, the uh, canoeing trails, all of the things that people are working at on in the hidden heartlands is part of the solution to that problem. But again, don't get carried away. We are very badly provided in Ireland with separated cycleways and walkways. We have the, if we didn't have the canal towpaths, which were built uh, just after Goldsmith's time, we would have even fewer. When you think that Germany has two and a half thousand kilometers of separated walkway where, and cycleway, where you don't go near the road, France is 1,300 kilometers, Spain is something like 900 kilometers, we have about just over 100. I mean, we're part of our first greenway, the Michael Ring was name checked earlier on, he made a great deal out of the Mayo Ringway, uh, Greenway. But at Newport, these German cyclists who were persuaded to come over and cycle the Western Greenway were dropped onto a narrow road under a bridge with the coaches of other tourists coming around the corner. The N67, on the Wild Atlantic Way, that road past the Cliffs of Mar, one of the most beautiful, the most, an awful, 80% of the imagery of, that of Ireland that goes abroad goes from those few counties. And that is a narrow road with tourist buses. The Ring of Kerry is a narrow road with tourist buses on it. We are in a desperate position where we have very little separated cycleway and we're trying to make a deal out of the separated cycleways we have, and everybody in this room knows the problems. You know, the Waterford Greenway and the South Kerry Greenway were both announced at the same time. By the time the landowners got stuck in, the South Kerry one came to a halt. Waterford is long open, South Kerry still hasn't been completed. That becomes a bigger problem in the more touristic regions than it becomes in places like the Hidden Heartlands. That's one of the dilemmas, the dilemma of being a local attraction versus being a national attraction, that's one of the areas where it can turn to your advantage. The dilemma of dispersal. Everybody who comes to Ireland is heading to the same places, five counties. If you take out the five, the brands, there are five of them, and you look at them, and you look and quantify the figures of international tourists coming in. I don't want to fill people's heads with figures. I'm going to read this figure, these figures out tonight. The Wild Atlantic Way gets 37.3% of international visitors to Ireland. Dublin gets 35.1%. Dublin's campaign is all about the mountains to the sea. It used to be uh, Dublin, a, uh, Dublin a breath of fresh air at one stage, but I, I'm not sure who thought up of that. I think that belongs with, uh, with Australia, where the bloody hell are you? The North East, which is mainly around Antrim, is uh, Tourism NI's territory, gets 11%. Sorry, uh, the, the Ancient East gets 14%. Then we have the six counties in Northern Ireland, 11%. The Hidden Heartlands gets 2.5%. We have one brand which gets 37.3% 
and one brand that gets two and a half percent. Now, if you're in the business of getting international tourists and you get a 2.5% market share, if you get a 2.5% mar market share of anything, baked beans or whatever, you know, you've got to say, there's something leaning on us here, which is more than just our product. There's something. If you were to go right across Europe, it's very hard to find a disparity like that. Um, there are... Um, Spain would have 17 provinces and one of the provinces gets just over 2%, 2.5% of international tourism, Mestre Madura. Uh, Alentejo in Portugal is the poorest of the provinces in terms of international tourism. That gets a much higher percent, it gets about 14%. So 2.5% is way off and that bears out something that was said with absolute clarity by Arthur earlier on. Okay, um, we picked Cork, Kerry, Galway, Dublin and Antrim. Um, where's Longford? It got left behind, and it got left behind without the benefit of the marketing muscle, the credibility, even the credibility in a meeting of having big players with us. Which brings us then to the other dilemma the dilemma of history. Remember, this is small history. This is tourism history. This is not the big history. The tourism history of Ireland is that it was immensely successful in a very short period of time. There's a sort of an incredulity in the 90s that we started off with two tourism organisations, Board Falch at the time and um, Northern Ireland Tourist Board at the time. It's now Tourism NI. And we ended up at three. We ended up at Tourism Ireland, doing the international market. Falch Ireland sulking, doing a little bit of international marketing themselves while they weren't supposed to. And Tourism NI just behaving like they always did. Just international marketing and home holiday marketing. So we now have three. But we used to have two, by the way, who didn't talk to each other back in the 50s. And the, we had a couple of great visionaries transformed Irish tourism and an accident transformed Irish tourism. The accident was John Wayne and Maureen O'Hara. Everybody remembers the scene where um, he's dragging her by the hair. But he also dragged Irish tourism by the hair into the world market at a time when there were aircraft, um, lots of decommissioned World War II troop carriers, airlines were buying them up for half nothing, Transatlantic flights were a thing. Interestingly enough, the very first transatlantic flight to come into Shannon had one paying customer and 28 journalists on it. <laughs> something, like, it's something that still tends to happen. But we had a terrible shortage of beds. It was the 1950s. And something amazing happened. The women of Ireland, Mnona Heron, the farmers' wives, resourceful women, who would be used to going down to the market with a few eggs off the hens to try and you know, make a few, few uh, pence for themselves. They went to Falcha Ireland at the time, Port Falcha, and said, we want to set up a, a movement, a network of beds. The bed and breakfast movement came out of the women of Ireland, not the men of Ireland. So the commercial hotels with the damp sheets and all of those things that all these Americans are arriving and saying, I want to see the place where the quiet man was, was made. No beds, bad roads, no way of getting there, bad buses. And the women of Ireland came up with what became a very successful um, precedent for the rest of Europe, the bed and breakfast movement. I've been in places which have had a little bit of a tourism surge and no beds. And I've used this example again and again. I spoke about it in the Faroe Islands and in Iceland um, in the early 10s, the early teens. When you, at the same time, you had the visionary of Irish tourism, uh, very easily named, very easily found on Google, Brendan O'Regan, lots of things he did. He invented uh, the duty free in Shannon which nobody had ever thought of before. You don't have tax in the airport. He invented um, the 
Bonratti Castle and the idea of you know dinner shows. It's, it's not that difficult. Din Disney do it. Everybody does it. Ma dinner shows which recreate it, um, medieval Ireland for tourists. He invented standards in the Irish hotel industry. Darrow's here. He knows exactly what I'm talking about. Um, the Irish, to Irish hotel industry was really directed by the foibles of a few eccentric characters who were um, the dominant figures. He started the Shannon, he, went, he sent his own people away to Switzerland where he'd gone himself to train in hospitality and then started the Shannon College. Started getting standards, started getting the sort of things that international tourists, when they came, didn't get the local hospitality that we were used to in Ireland. They got something they recognised as being international. And that meant that they became, we became something that other countries look to. Shannon now, about 50% of the students who come to Shannon come from uh, for other countries because Ireland is seen as a leader in terms of training, in terms of standards, in terms of all of that. Now, we have our problems, our huge staffing problems because of a separate issue which anybody involved in the industry in the room here will I quickly identify as a reluctance to engage with the services sector by young Irish people. But that is today's problem. What happened with the to leave Irish tourism in that terrible misshapen state it's in, 37.3% in one brand and 2.5%, is down to the history of what are of those huge successes, reliance on the US market, transatlantic services, the building up of Dublin as a transatlantic hub. We now have more flights. The, the only airline with more flights in the air to, tomorrow, the only European airline with more transatlantic flights in the air across the North Atlantic tomorrow than Aer Lingus is British Airways. We have the airline with the second highest number of aircraft crossing the, the Atlantic, ahead of Air France, ahead of the Lufthansa Group, ahead of Iberia, bigger airlines, because of our geographical position. We've done um, lots of things that are terrific in tourism. Our, the, the numbers are amazing. We get more international tourists than Cyprus does. And Cyprus has a thing in the sky called the sun. We do all of this, and yet, under our nose, we have this misshape, misshapen tourism model of our own, which we haven't, we haven't rectified. And if this happened, in a, can you imagine in any other industry, where one of your five, four in the Republic, one in the North, one of your five major regions was left for two and a half percent. The bit that fell off the table when they were clearing it, the crumbs. There would, somebody would sit back and say, there's something wrong here. How, what were you thinking of, guys? Either redraw the map or do something to positively discriminate in favour of the two and a half percent, the people who are getting two and a half percent. As it happened, Santa Claus arrived. He's sitting there uh, beside the pillar. Uh, he's a little bit thinner than Santa Claus, yeah. But when, if you were to look at the figures for 2018, 40,000 international tourists coming to Longford, themselves and Fermanagh are the smallest. You also look at the number of hotel beds in the country. You get this enormous amount of hotel beds in Killarney and in Limerick, and Dublin, of course, dwarfs everyone else. The country with the least was Longford. Now that's been rectified. Uh, Central Parks has brought two and a half thousand hotel uh, sleepers to Ballymahan, effectively. And with the expansion, I think it's 1,000 more on its way, isn't it? So from 2018, the Centre Parks experience has brought Longford into sort of a leading position. I mean, the, we've, it's been well publicised. This is the biggest private investment. But can you imagine if there was a strategy 
to try and recreate that across the counties of the hidden heartlands. That, you know, we've, we've got... Um, We've got a bed crisis. We had a bed crisis looming before COVID in Dublin, and very few beds. Hotels been closed. You know, like the juries, Burlington. You know, places been closed, and none, not enough on their way. And we now are seeing, with Pierce Doherty's claim from a constituent, that it was cheaper to see a concert in Rome than it was in Dublin by the time the hotel price in Dublin was factored in. We now see the same bed crisis. There is, no, there is no reason with the road systems in Ireland, there's no reason to house our tourists in the at metropolis or in the metropoli. That's a, we have, I think we have a few Latin scholars here. And leave our good section of our country with very few beds. I mean, there is a precedent in places it's a, it's a small it's not a big country there are there is a precedent a precedent in places like the Netherlands like Belgium like some of the eastern european country where beds have been strategically placed in areas which have less tourism and where they're more welcome by the way both by local residents planning authorities everyone else but that requires something better than um, yours to uncover. I don't have a lot of answers, but one of the things that we can look forward to and say with certainty has been, is, has left us with some sort of advantage here in the, hidden, in the hidden heartlands, is the sort of the clearing of the boards that was done by COVID. We don't know for certain what the shape of post-COVID tourism is going to be. We do know it's going to be different. We do know that the Barcelona Dubrovnik uh, crowding situation is probably not going to be the way forward. 5,400 cruise ships of 5,400 passengers and 2,700 crew, bigger than the town of Longford floating around in the middle of the Mediterranean. What we do know is that people are going to look for the separated experience, the wide open space, the sort of wind blowing through your hair. And it doesn't have to be the cliffs of Moher. This is a very interesting bit. People aren't, we get a little obsessed a little bit because of our beautiful coast and our rocks. A country like Germany, which we have a very small market share, considering the importance of the German market in terms of numbers and spend, our market share is 0.7%. I mean, it's 2.4% of Britain. Imagine if we 2.4% of the German market. Things, uh, what do the Germans think of when they want to come to Ireland? The surveys show, the tourism Ireland show, bogs. They're not that carried away with the sun. They're not carried away with the same sort of imagery that the uh, Americans are. Of course, they do love it. But they want the sort of product that the Hidden Heartlands does well, as well as what the Wild Atlantic well, uh, Way does well. We don't know for certain the shape of post-COVID tourism, but every time there's disruption, be it in the way the story is told, as in the arrival of Instagram and TripAdvisor, there are opportunities. And I think the post-COVID world where the crowded pubs of Temple Bar are no longer the ideal, is an opportunity. While we take it, I don't know, I think there's a great Goldsmith quote about you remembering the missed opportunities rather than the ones you take, but the, how we take it is up to us in this room tonight. The interesting thing about Goldsmith's poem, The Traveller, was that he didn't dedicate it. It was normal to dedicate it to somebody who was paying, to dedicate your poetry to somebody who's paying for it. That was a good move, still a good move, by the way. Um, you, he dedicated it to his brother. There were seven in the family. I think Henry was one of two twins. And where was Henry? He was back here 
in the hidden heartlands. He had ended up returning home after what some people called a drunken riot. And uh, he returned home and got married um, to a love of his life back in Longford. And then he uh, ended up dying after what some people called a drunken riot, or some people said an incident on his way home from a pub, which may or may not have been uh, the pigeons. But it, he, was in, he wasn't rich, he was quite poor. And while Oliver Goldsmith was in Switzerland writing the first poem that bore his own name, the poem that made him a travel commentator in close to what is the modern sense, it's not purely a sense of travel writing, it's more a commentary on how people behave. He wrote, Where'er I roam, whatever returns to sea, my heart untravelled fondly turns to thee. Still to my brother turns with ceaseless pain and drags at each remove a lengthening chain. My finish to my talk before I, and I will take a few questions, was going to be, Oliver, I couldn't have said it better myself, it's a bit naff as you might know, but Earlier this today, when I was coming down, before I came down, I said I was, uh, I made that point about Oliver's wonderful Augustan, um, grandiose, uh, rhyming couplets. And I said I was going to be looking really excited about talking here tonight, which I was. And I said I wouldn't do it, uh, or sadly, I wouldn't be able to do it in rhyming couplets. But while I was uh, inspired by Dara's fine words, I decided to try. So here we go, and there are two uh, noble uh, goldsmith scholars from the University of Limerick here. I want you to avert your ears now, gentlemen. <laughs> when with haste we repaired to fairest Abbey Shrule to join the pointed wisdom at goldsmith's summer school to see the gathering pride we found among helping hands gathered midst the lakes, the rivulets, canals, to build a great success from Ireland's smallest brand, where Oliver's footprints imprint the sacred land. I'd like to thank Owen for an uh, informative, inspirational, and he asked an awful lot of questions, and I think he put an awful lot of issues in context. And listening to the whole lot, I was struck by, you know, we're, I know we're from the Hidden Heartlands, but I'm speaking specifically from Longford, and I just think I got a sense of pride in the middle of the whole lot. We do have some fantastic things. We, I just hope that the future is, as he said, moving away from the Barcelonas and the Killarneys. Because what we have is something absolutely fantastic. It's real. Myself and my good wife down there, um, she hates that phrase, by the way, but <laughs> <laughs> we travelled to Killarney last August, my first time in it in about 20 years, and with, with some friends, and it was a four-day four break. And it was great, and you know, we had a nice time, and we did it only carry, but it cost us an absolute fortune. We felt robbed. I felt absolutely robbed coming back. And I just thought, the experience I had in Killarney, I could have had it much better in by getting up on my bike and going to Fyha. Or the following Friday, the following Friday, a few of us cycled out here and Edward had a fantastic mar, mar, mar tea up. And we had a few pints and we had a lovely meal. And it was far, far better than any Killarney. Far, far better. The Royal Canal Greenway, I think, can be a spine for not just Longford, but a lot of area of the Hidden Heartlands. And some of the work being done is absolutely fantastic. There's a gentleman down here who was in, who, in the audience who was instra, instrumental in some of the, um, the new wetlands. So, having listened to all, I actually feel proud, absolute pride, and also, I think, great hope. And I think the future might be turning our way. So now, um, 
Now I'm going to take a, a couple of questions. I'm going to be very strict about the time because we've had had a long night. So I'm going to put 10 minutes on this phone, okay? When, when the buzzer goes, if I can take it off silent, we're finished. So could I start with, uh, I just want to ask basically, can we have one question and one observation? Can you make it reasonably short and sharp? No and, speeches. And no, yeah, we, we've had a speech short. A question or an observation? And we used to have a roving mic, Claire, we don't have one unfortunately. So if if I can hear it or you might if we can't hear it, you might be able to repeat the question. So anyone like to start get the ball rolling with a question and observation? Anyone there? Can I see a hand? I see the gentleman here at the at the back, yeah. Hi Michael. Marketfield, um, I guess you know, that's a tremendous observation you make about long for people being ambassadors. What has been happening in recent years, it was really bad during the Celtic Tiger. We had a history of everywhere we went in the world, when we met tourists, we'd say, come to Ireland, it's a beautiful place. You're going to be so welcome here. We've got, we mightn't have the best weather, but we've got the best people. You're going to be, we're a really welcoming nation. We stopped saying that. I was away with group with Irish people who said, um, you'll get ripped off here. Our prices are too high. We got to, we don't have the big marketing budgets that California and Vegas, Las Vegas and uh, places like that have, Italy and Spain. What we had was our own people acting as our ambassadors, as our marketeers, selling over dinner in a bar on a boat trip in another country saying, come to Ireland. It's what Longford people can do. Come to Ireland and come to Longford. Wait till you tell you about this place. And maybe we should stop obsessing about the, um, the issues which are dominating the media. Um, and I am a member of the media, so I'm criticizing my own, um, my own profession here about particularly the price. Um, Northern Europe charges more than Southern Europe. It's as simple as that. You know, where our markup, or the way our the hospitality industry is built, the markup is on wine. You know, bottles of wine are expensive at a meal. Um, the accommodation thing goes very much supply demand. It's very raw compared with food and beverage. I think Dara would know more about this than I do. But so we we've got to sort of say. We're not, we, we, when we travel, we've got to start saying again, 
come to Ireland. Because sometimes the visitor's expectation, and this applies to price, which we're, we're you know, we all say we can get to Portugal, we can get a meal out in Portugal for this price, we pay this price in Ireland. The, ex the visitor's expectation isn't the same as what we perceive it to be. Michal's point is that we should be proud as Longford people, we should be proud as Irish people, and we should, everywhere we go, help build that tourism product because have we the confidence in our product to do that? That's the question we all have to ask ourselves. And what I'm saying tonight, and what Arthur's just said, is there's no reason why we shouldn't. Have we a question? Mr. Clare. Oh yeah, Claire, herself. classic example of what I'm talking about, we take it for granted. For someone uh, from Central Europe, seeing a cow in a field is exciting. You know, um, in Belgium they're all indoors, they never get out. Um, when, when you drive to, through a village like Gavin Shrew, all the approach roads have the food that's going to be served in the Rusty Inn. You know, for, on view. It's like We've, we've got a, a, a film crew in and told them, you know, to, to shoot exactly what you can expect in Ireland because this is what we naturally do. Farming is what we naturally do. The tapestry of what I drove through, my journey down from County Kildare tonight with the shades of green and the different crops in the field is a joy. It's something we take for granted and it's something that sometimes some of our markets appreciate more than others. I keep going back to the German market. They just, this is what they imagine Ireland to be. And this is what we deliver for them. One of the big surprises, uh, and it's back to um, the CIE tours in the round 10, 15 years ago, was when they introduced the customer satisfaction surveys and they asked them what sort of experiences they liked. You'd have expected the Bonratty Castle singers to be in there, which they are, I'm sure. But what turned up to be top one, two, and three was going to a farm in Kerry where a sheepdog rounded up the sheep. Now, the sheepdog has been doing this and his grandmother and his great-grandmother and his great-great-grandmother for generations. And the farmer has been whistling and the sheep have been rounded up. And everybody knows their part in this pageant which is acted out on the Kerry hillsides forever. But Americans, especially, of their CIE tours is very American, so it's not representative of the other markets, got out of their buses, and when they finished their trip, they wrote that down as the most amazing thing they'd ever seen. What, extrapolating from that, what we take for granted, our rural agricultural lifestyle, what Irish people have been doing since we built Newgrange, is one of our biggest attractions, and we don't realise it. In the same way that people go to watch pearl divers, or the cliff jumpers in Acapulco, you know, that evening sunset thing where you go out in the boat and everybody gets overcharged for everything. So all of these things that we do naturally, it comes naturally to us, part of our nature, can be hugely important. And it's not landscape specific. Well, it is landscape specific, you can't do it in the city, but it's not county specific. It doesn't have to happen in Kerry. It's what the, and it's back to basic marketing and basic chasing the market. Let's not do what other people have already cornered and it's gonna be expensive to win. Let's work out what, or it's going to be expensive to train so many people to do all of this thing. Let's work out what we do that is attractive and we take so much for granted about our natural things we do in our own life. An example would be, 
Irish dancing, Irish music. For years, generations, we've been, we've been playing it. Then Michael Flatley came along and everybody wanted to see it. But what we could do instead of, you know, the Bulgarian folk dance where they bring everyone in and train them up, and we didn't have to train anyone up because we've Irish, we're coming down with Irish dancing competitions. And we have generations of young people who could dance and uh, sing and play amazing instruments that the tourists thought, must, some of them thought they were just being trained up, you know, you, you trawl the country for them. Every village in Ireland is coming down with that. Every village in Ireland is coming down with hurlers and footballers, less so Longford than other, uh, some of the other counties. Westmeath has a strong hurling tradition. But all of the things we do for granted, take for granted, that agricultural background, that rural lifestyle, the way we conducted ourselves and enjoyed ourselves, our sports, our pastimes, our industries, all of those are natural to us and they're all there. And somehow we've managed not to realise the opportunity that is in there. Think of that sheep, dog, and Kerry. We're just going to take two more then, okay? Because we're gentlemen here and uh, in front. So yourself, yeah, please. There's no doubt that the future of the bogs is in tourism. The future of the bog is the amazing plant life there and the, the um, museum heritage of how turf transformed the landscape and was part of rural life. All of that has been, to say badly handled is probably too harsh. I mean, we had the train, it's, I think it's up in Lollymore now. It was in Clonmacnoise for many years and, Customers were brought out, and you know they footed turf for everything. But it, it's gonna it's 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 gonna take a little bit more sophisticated. But we have um, a habitat at a time when habitats are trendy, when habitats are uh, they're immune from <coughs> the arguments about flight shaming and things like that that we should be exploiting. I was contributor to um, the. Uh, T.G. Catter series on this, on the tourism question with Monica McGann. Um, you have another question, point coming in here as well. No, just to finish that, you know it's the Eden Project in Cornwall. Yes. I think we should have an Eden Project between Loch Ree and Longford Town. We've got the bog. They can't take the bog or Loch Ree away from us. So That's right. Killarney boys can't take it. I'm from Kerry, by the way. Right. <laughs> uh, we're just going to Killarney. <laughs> St. Brendan's. I think the Eden Project is the future. Would you think there's value in that? Yeah, the Eden Project I've seen, it's got, um, it's, it's, got it's sort of a, a, a bit too Disney-ish for me, you know, and the big greenhouses and things like that. But you're absolutely right. Um, temple, a temple, a celebration of nature and the natural habitat like that is what we can do without any expense in Longford. One more. We're just going to take one more and, uh, yeah, yourself, sorry. Yeah. Hi, Matt. Is this Edwardstown or Moss Trim?
Two things, you have to do something else. You have to, uh, here's an incentive by the way, is price. Um, if the price, uh, hotel prices are, they're fighting, Abby and, uh, and Pab and uh, Brendan and CI are forever, when I'm talking to them, giving out about uh, prices. They do tend to end up in, um, Joe Dolan's hotel in Leitrim has a, quite a lot of coach tours going through because he doesn't charge the Wild Atlantic way. But you're absolutely right. Uh, some would call it lazy, some people would call it finding the line of least resistance. They need something to jolt them out of what they're doing. And there are a couple of things that will do that. One of them is um, somebody making a lot of noise about their product. And the first point I made tonight is very often the people who make the mo uh, most noise aren't the best product. Um, people will go where the big tour operators send them. And sometimes the tour operators are sending them not for, the actual reality is tourists really in a coach tour or even a big tour operator don't chose where to go. They think it's a great idea to go to Tanzania for holidays, but then they look at the price, they go back to the same places. So to get the, your absolutely what will deliver the numbers is the tour operators, but it takes something to jolt them. The price will jolt them customer, you know, noise will join if they see there's an awful lot of excitement about a particular product. And the excitement is a good, the good example of the, of creating excitement is here in the room, it's what Centre Parks did. But it's, it, and it doesn't need that enormous budget that Centre Parks has. Something small can jolt it and get people thinking about it. And all, and um, they will come, but once they, 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 they need, they need something to make them move away from those lines of least resistance. All the tour operators are doing exactly what they did 40 years ago. And that's a problem. And you would think that some competitor would come in and say, oh, let's do something different and get a whole load of bookings. And there are been, but they've been small out in the end of the margins, you know, the people that have been doing that. I think if you were to look for a headline, that you can want to differentiate a tour operator and give them a competitive advantage in big markets like Germany and, Britain and America. It's the favorite, the favorite word in tourism at the moment is sustainable. Most people, are, everyone is using it, but not everyone knows, can understand it, but they all love the word and it's very ill-defined. But if we can sort of shape tour operators and say, Longford has the most, the best product in sustainable tourism, and because you've such an undamaged tourism landscape, your habitats are pristine, your land is, county is empty, smallest population, and you're coming down, you have loads of water and rivulets and canals and lakes, you could be in a position to move into that and adopt. Uh, I, I, I'm loath to use the word high moral ground in a county which doesn't have any mountains, but you're actually in a position to use something like that to jolt your tour operator.